Good evening and welcome everyone to the 61st Open NLP Hypnosis Meetup. And tonight is my absolute pleasure to introduce our guest, Michelle Wozniak. A little Hi, background. <laughs> it's good to see you, man. Um, I first met Michelle in uh, Orlando, Florida, funnily enough. I think it was 2016. And uh, it was the first time I was in Florida to meet Dr. Bandler. And I clearly recall enjoying speaking to Michelle because there were a lot of people that were very busy and he was completely unfazed. And he was smiling, he was open, he was welcome. And I just thought, what a bloody nice fella. Um, I very quickly learned, as I didn't realize in the moment, that Michelle is an NLP trainer, uh, already was an NLP trainer, and is part of Dr. Bandler's international uh, assistant training team. And that he's actually translating from English to French real time for Dr. Bandler at that seminar and many others between Florida and the UK. In a following conversation, I learned that he had spent time with Dr. Bandler modeling Dr. Dr. Bandler to enhance his translation for French speaking students, and that he very fluently speaks five languages and what he calls a bit of a few others. Now, coming from New Zealand, where I speak one language and to be bilingual is quite unusual, um, I was suitably impressed, shall we say, at the very least. I then found out that uh, I met Michelle on, uh, I actually did the course Teaching Excellence with him, with Kate Benson, who most of you have met. And I there found out that uh, Michelle is actually one of very few master trainers of Tony Buzan's mind mapping and memory techniques skill set. Um, it's actually a grandmaster trainer. <laughs> a grandmaster yes. trainer, I stand corrected. <laughs> uh, and I think there's only a few of you worldwide. Is that correct, Michelle? Yeah, only five. Uh, only five, five and I'm the only one for uh, French speaking countries in the world, yes. Yeah. It never ceases to amaze me. Beyond and on top of all of that, in 2016, uh, Michelle successfully competed in the World Speed Reading and Comprehension Championships and attained the bronze medal, which uh, you're going to learn a little bit more about tonight. Um, and look, this is only an overview of a small portion of what Michelle actually gets up to. So we're going to cover these things in a bit more detail and we might get a little more out of them this evening. But there's one thing that absolutely remains true. He's still going. Michelle's ongoing commitment in different areas of, himself, of his life to improve himself and to share the ability to improve yourself with other people has absolutely resonated with me every time we've met. And I'm wrapped that he's here tonight. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Orlando. And hello, everyone. So before I dive into our three primary topics as advertised this evening, uh, Michelle, for many people, what you are capable of is quite extraordinary, to say the very least. Would you share with us what led to this being your direction in life? Oh, um, what led to that? I, I, I think the, the answer is, uh, is just a single word. It's burnout. <laughs> I had a, a very severe burnout uh, after having worked for 13 years for an international company. Uh, I was project manager. I was managing about 200 people. We're on pro uh, one of the biggest projects was about 60 million euros. And uh, when I finished the project, I completely fell apart. <laughs> so um, it, it was up to an extent that uh, doctors said that I was a vegetable. I don't know which one, if it was more of a <laughs> cucumber or I don't know which one they, they would have picked. But uh, yeah, that was the, the, the thing. And what happened then was that I had either the choice of... Uh, taking the regular track, which is going to a psychiatrist, taking drugs, being a vegetable for many, many years, or uh, accept to take my life in my hands and do something out of it. So this is what I did. And I think one of the most interesting thing is that I started to appreciate um, more the journey than the achievement in itself. 
And I think that is one of the big, uh, a big thing that changed my direction in life, appreciating the journey. So yeah, it was um, essentially that. And yeah, you, you mentioned uh, so some of the things that, I, that I've been achieving. Uh, I never intend to achieve those things. But when I get passionate about something, I just get better and better and better. And ultimately, there's a result. So it can be speed reading champion. Uh, I was also considered in Hawaii in Habilitat, which is one of the best drug rehab in the world, one of the top uh, uh, addiction experts in the world. Uh, the, also, I've been decorated with, along with Tony Buzan uh, by Prince Marek Kaspersky for achievements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it was never intended. It was always the cherry on the cake or the result of something. And I think this is the biggest secret, I would say, of, uh, of uh, everything I, I'm doing now. It's appreciating the process. So, Michelle, uh, just to clarify, I, I know you're in Switzerland now. Um, yes. And you started in France, is that correct? Yes. And you mentioned Hawaii. Was that you were recognized from Hawaii or have you been there as well? I've been there. I've been there for uh, three years in a row. I was uh, going there for uh, some three weeks to one month period uh, of time. And uh, I was working with all the residents over there. We were a group of about 10 people working with um, methods derived from NLP, but, but therapeutic. And uh, yes, so during three years, I was doing that and with just amazing results. Oh, that is awesome. Um, I, I'm already starting to find reasons to get you back here for another line of questioning, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I will stick to the plan. Or I do have a tendency to go off on tangents, as everyone here is quite aware of, but uh, I will stick to the plan. <laughs> so, um, Michelle, you are one of Tony Bazan's five grandmaster trainers of mind mapping and memory techniques. Um, so how did it come to pass that you, what specifically motivated you to seek out, was it memory or mind mapping or Tony himself? How, how did that happen? Uh... I, I think it was uh, a logical process because after the burnout, I, I wondered who would be the people who could help me to get through all the, uh, all the present situation. And two names came to my mind. Uh, there was Dr. Richard Bandler for, um, in order to be able to learn new strategies and also Tony Buzan because he was the the master in memory, in uh, speed reading, in mind mapping. And for me, uh, he was one of the, uh, of the gurus that I wanted to meet and to, yeah, and to practice a lot. So I actually, at that moment, I sold my car uh, in order to buy the trainings. Uh, so all the best trainings I could find with Tony, I bought them to make sure that I would be with him. And when I met him, I simply went to him and explained my situation. I said, okay, I need your help. And he said, okay. <laughs> so that was the beginning of a big journey, which is, uh, yeah, which was a six, seven years long journey. Yeah. Wow. That I did not know. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> what was it that kept you, I mean, you know, six or seven years to study memory that to me it seems like a long time although in saying that i do understand the process you learn and you become hungry for more the more we learn the more we don't know in some respects but what what was it that uh that kept you going year upon year and seeking more it, it looks obvious but really the real answer is uh is serendipity you know it's just discovering new things and having the curiosity of going to other directions. You know, like you said, when you start an interview, sometimes you just go to other, to other aspects, you just uh, dive to other aspects. And this is exactly what I'm doing. You know, I'm, uh, each time I'm learning something, I just discover new things and I love that. Uh, you know, it, for me, it's all about uh, you know, what we call in NLP anchors. Uh, some people have very negative anchors about learning. 
which means that when they need to learn something, listen to the words need. <laughs> this is a, a very, a very interesting word to just show that it's not something you do with pleasure. And I have completely reprogrammed my, my view about learning. My passion is learning. If I have the choice of spending a whole evening on Netflix watching a great series or just learning something new, I want to learn that something new. And it's really not something that is, um, I would say, it's not something hard for me. I love it. It's, uh, it's refreshing for me. And this, this happened just by me changing my beliefs about learning, my, um, my ideas about learning. And, you know, there's a, a kind of um, vicious circle when you do something because you have to do it, you generate some stress. And whenever you have stress in your body, you generate a hormone called cortisol. And cortisol has one very specific action. It inhibits the working of a little part of the brain, which is called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the entry point of long-term memory. So if you are stressed when you are learning something, even just with a, a belief that it will be hard, this is enough for the brain to just shut down no, you have a physical, a chemical barrier, barrier that inhibits you uh, or that hinders you from learning and from doing the work. So this is something you, you need to track every single belief, every, every single uh, stress that is connected to learning. You have to get rid of it. And at that moment, it becomes really efficient. And sometimes even a little bit of that can completely screw the thing up. So it's really something you need to do regularly. And each time I learn new things, I just discover new aspects in me that perhaps um, were based on a limiting belief or anything like that. And each time I need to work on that so that it's just pure pleasure. So it's really got me one. Before we go on to the other questions I've got written down, it's tangent time already. Can you turn it off? Do, do, yes. you, do you ever stop? Uh, yes. Um, I, I can turn it off like anything you do, but I don't want to because for me, it's, it's pure pleasure. You know, it, just as if you have somebody who lives out of a passion, like, for example, I don't know, driving uh, sports cars. Can he switch that off? Yes, sure, he can, but he doesn't want to. And that's exactly the same uh, the same thing. I can switch anything I want off, but I don't want to. <laughs> so th this might be a silly question, but what do you do to relax? Um, many things. For example, just before this masterclass, I went to have a half an hour walk in the grass, bare feet, and just breathing and just, okay, living in the, in the present. And I'm lucky enough that my body gives me some signals. For example, uh, I started to have a headache before. And I said, okay, this means that I need to just breathe a little bit and go out. And yeah, when I take the time to do it, this is my best way uh, of relaxing. Walking, being outside in this beautiful Switzerland. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> Look, I've had the opportunity to uh, watch and be aware of the memory in action during teaching excellence. Uh, Kate gave us several tasks to do, uh, which were all completed by Michelle before anyone else in the room, <laughs> especially those that included memory. And quite frankly, I just forgot to do half the tasks, but uh, <laughs> I was enjoying myself. Um, <clears throat> so, um, for, for anyone that's wanting to improve their memory, which I know is a very big label, but where, where would they start? For, for me, really, it's not about having memory techniques. Memory techniques are really the cherry on the cake. And, you know, many people, when they want to get better with memory, they go and buy a book on memory techniques and they try to apply them. The problem is that the technique is just a technique. Uh, 
you, you need to, to generate the right environment in order for it to work. Just like gardening, you just don't take the best possible seeds, you put them in a, uh, in, in a bad ground, it won't work, it won't grow, it's not possible, even if you buy the best seeds ever. Here it's the same thing. So for, for me, the very first step is to track those limiting beliefs. I, I come back all the time to the same topic. It's the limiting beliefs. If you think that learning is hard, this will generate the stress, it will inhibit the hippocampus, and you won't have your entry point for long-term memory. That's as simple as that. So that's why the one of the things that I advise to people, uh, for those who know about heart coherence, it's a way of breathing, you know, where you inhale for five seconds, then you exhale for five seconds, and you do that repeatedly for about five minutes. And this completely um, stabilizes your levels of cortisol. So even if you have those uh, limiting beliefs, it will limit the damages of uh, the stress hormone. So this is one thing that I really advise people is adding in your daily routine uh, five minutes of heart coherence. And for about three to four hours, your brain is protected in brackets against those kinds of limiting beliefs or stresses. So this would be one of the most important points. So managing the stress with breathing. Is that and, five, five minutes of that, was, did you say? Yeah, five minutes. Wow. Uh, the, the best option is, is three, six, five. You know, it's a, it's a nice metaphor. 365 is three times a day, six breathings per minute, which is five seconds inhale, five seconds exhale, and uh, for five minutes. Three times a day for five minutes. And this is one of the best thing that I could uh, encounter when, uh, when I started to really progress with memory. And then when you have that right environment, then techniques start to be interesting. And you don't get, uh, you, you don't reach, you know, those kinds of limits. Because if you just use techniques, it will work up to a certain point. At one moment, you will feel that you cannot progress anymore. You know, just like typing on the keyboard with only two fingers. It works and you can be very fast, but you will feel at one moment that the moves of the fingers prevent you from going even faster. So the technique is really a second step. The first step is creating the right environment. Well, that's, that's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. Um, during one of the conversations that we had in Florida, you described a process of modeling that you completed with Dr. Bandler. I believe it was to enhance your ability uh, to translate real time from English into French. Now, I, I forget what it was that prevented that conversation continuing, but I remember being in, in rapture of, of the conversation and I never got to hear the end. So would you be kind enough to share that with us? It's probably because it's a very hidden secret. <laughs> no, no, yeah. So modeling is really a big word, you know. Uh, just just a few words before uh, before I tell you what I did. Uh, I, I went to NLP to learn modeling, and when at one training I heard Richard say that he never taught modeling and he will never teach modeling because it's dangerous. I, that, <laughs> what am I doing here? Man, that's, I want that in an LP. And, and he actually explained it and um, he explained what he meant. And I completely understood, understood that. For example, you know, when uh, there, there's a kind of myth that all the actors that are playing the, the character of the Joker, that it leaves very deep marks on the on the person, you know. Uh, even um, uh, Heath Ledger, he he died at the uh, age twenty eight. Uh, it was it, even during the post production of the movie. So is it connected or not? We don't know. But the fact is that when you model somebody, you really enter into the person's personality, into their life, into their shoes, into their mind. And the problem is that we're all so different that my, I am probably not compatible with many other people. Uh, 
And Richard says, don't try to become a Richard Bandler because the place is already taken. And that's really true. But Richard says also, if you still want to become me, then start with the arm that I broke when I was three, year, three years old. Because all this, all the experience that he had in life really created who he is. So for me, starting with that, when I, when I started to translate Richard, I needed to find a way to get better. And to get better, you know, translation is the use of, la of language. It's everything but rational. It's completely irrational. So, so I started to think, what can I do? I need to develop an irrational process, but the problem is that rationality is always here working. So the first idea I had was to occupy my conscious mind. So that's why when I'm translating, generally, I am playing a game on my telephone. So, you know, those kind of uh, bubble games and some stupid uh, things, or now I am calculating, you know, uh, uh, on, uh, <laughs> on those kinds of, uh, of Chinese uh, abacus, uh, because I, I'm learning that now. It, it is one of my last challenge. I'm, um, I, I'm taking a course, you know, in, uh, in doing that with children between 8 and 15 years old who are all geniuses. So <laughs> it's just another stupid challenge, but it's, it works great. And, and so I'm occupying my conscious mind. And, and this for me, when you want to do something uh, unconscious is a, very good, uh, is a very good training because then you realize that when you can do the translation, and this is one example among others, while doing something else, you really master the thing. And the second challenge that I had with, uh, with Richard was that the first time I was doing the translation, it was in London, uh, there were was, there was some organizational problems and I didn't have a translation booth, you know, with uh, a screen, etc. I was in the corridor outside, you know, with a mic, a uh, high frequency mic where, that was transmitting to people inside the room. I didn't see anybody. There was mo uh, people moving around, there was noise, and I couldn't see Richard. So my first challenge was, okay, how do I do that? Because in NLP, we're very much um, calibrating. We're looking at the person. And we know that even in language, perhaps only 20% is in the words that are being used. The rest is in the nonverbal, the paraverbal. So it was a real challenge. And at that moment, I really, really, really needed to try in my mind to enter into Richard's shoes. And one, one thing was very amazing. There was one assistant that was standing at the door and he was looking at Richard and looking at me until the moment where when he noticed that my moves were synchronized with Richard's moves. So I was moving the same way, you know, Richard uh, often also moves his leg in a specific way. He has very specific also moves in his arms. And that moment I knew that, that that's it, you know, I, uh, I have it. And that was a big step, but still, is that real modeling? I don't know, but that helped a lot. And when I get to those moments, which some people call uh, a state of flow, it's going just so easily that even the more he accelerates, the better I feel, you know? And, and this is something that many translators don't experience. Uh, when you have professional translators, very often they work about 20 minutes and they switch. Uh, when I translate Richard, I spend nine, eight or nine days translating eight hours a day alone. You know, it works great. Um, but still, it's the environment, you know, it's getting rid of the stress, getting rid of the uh, bad chemicals, uh, what, uh, what John Laval uh, calls uh, the brain juice. So it's cleaning your brain juice. And yeah, it works very good. So that, that was the way I was um, globally um, modeling Richard. And 
I also have a problem with this word because it's uh, it's a big word and everybody puts the definition they want behind it. I absolutely, and I respect that. I, I recall, uh, you've just reminded me, I recall you were, uh, when we were in Florida, again, I don't know if you were speaking to me or other people, but I was airwigging anyway. Um, you were speaking, I think you had, had done some translation at a conference of people that were into brain mapping of some description and yes. they, they wanted to play with you while you were there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was translating two experts in, uh, in brain waves and flow state. Um, who are Gary Grosbeck and Donna Back from uh, the United States. And while I was translating, at one moment during a break, I was talking with them and I said, okay, I think that when I'm translating, I'm in a flow state. And I think that I enter very rapidly in a flow state. And their idea was that it's not possible to enter into a flow state in less than 10 minutes, that it's a process, you need to go through a few steps, etc. And I challenged them a little bit. I said, okay, I think it's I think it's possible and I think I can do it. So they decided to connect me to the uh, to the EEG uh, during the break. And when we started, when the training started, I started to play on my telephone, I started to translate. And in about a minute, I, I see Donna who is looking at Gary, uh, who is giving the training. And just moving the head like this, I said, "Okay, I did it." <laughs> <laughs> and even you know, a few months ago, because this happened about three or four years ago, uh, a few months ago uh, on a social uh, on a uh, on a social network tool on Facebook on a group, I saw people talking about flow state. And somebody who said, yeah, you need to at least 10 minutes to do it. And I saw somebody answering, no, it's not true. I saw I saw one guy, Michael, who, <laughs> who did it live with, uh, with two experts. Okay, so it is possible. So I've got to ask the question then. For you, how similar is that flow state? Or is it a different form of state? And if so, is it a flow state? Uh, that is optimal for you to get into before doing memory techniques? Uh, I think it's always the same state. For me, a, a flow state is uh, is what we call um, a, a st um, an altered state of consciousness, which is hypnotic state. It's nothing else than this. So it's just about having the right conscious state or uh, yeah, the, the right state at the right moment. And because the human brain tends to change its state very often, we, we have the tendency to think or to feel that we cannot control that state. And actually that's not true, we can control it. And even for long periods of time, when I do the translation, I am completely there for eight hours. And it's not something that uh, is tiring. It's not something that makes me, uh, uh, exhausted at the end of the day not necessarily it will if I start to um, to control less if I start to be to to, to let my usual uh, thinking start again then I am going to be exhausted hmm. but and, and this is the paradox of control you know people often say yeah control is not good you need to let go but in order to let go, you need to control what's going on inside. You see, that's a paradox. In order to let go, you need to control. And through control, you can let go. So for me, uh, those words are not uh, opposite one to each other. They are very, very, very similar and very good friends. You know, if you, you realize that control is the best way of letting go, then everything's possible. Because if you focus only on letting go, then you miss half of the story, you know? Yeah. But if you see that both tools are useful and that both tools can get you to the, to the goal you have, it's perfect. Outstanding. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know about everyone else, but you've got my brain firing in different directions. <laughs> I'll see a few confused faces. So the, the enlightenment's on its way, I'm sure. Yeah, I see. I see. Uh, yeah, there's a, an interesting question here also from uh, 
it, it, it was a question to apparently to Rachel, what type of yoga uh, does you practice? Um, uh, it's interesting because th this idea of yoga and breathing, etc., is very important. Uh, for, for me, for example, I love to practice uh, the, the breathing I told you with heart coherence. I love also to practice uh, Wim Hof breathing. You know, if you know Wim Hof, is the guy who is the, the Iceman. Uh, it's been oh, about three years that I'm taking only cold showers and using his breathing technique, which is great. Uh, there is also power yoga that I'm doing uh, very often. So... There, there are plenty of things, you know, and it's just w about working on the environment. The more you create the right environment, the better everything goes. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, just while we're on the topic, there's just another couple of things I'd like to bring from the chat uh, that are quite pertinent with what you're talking about there. Um, one of the questions from Manel is, would you say there is a difference between control and awareness in the scenario that you are describing? Uh, for me, it will be synonymous. It's very similar because for me, control is, uh, is first being aware of what's going on uh, and then acting on that. So it's uh, an utiliza utilizational method. It's, uh, it's starting with where I am now. So you need awareness for that. And then asking myself where I want to go now from that point. And very often people, uh, when they don't uh, use that awareness, uh, they know where they want to get, but they don't know this, uh, the starting point. You know, just like a GPS, you can set the direction, but if the GPS cannot determine exactly where you are, it cannot calculate any route. It's not possible. If you're in a building, it will say, okay, no GPS signal. I cannot calculate anything. I have no idea where you are. And this is this requires a conscious process, you know. Even if we say that all this is in conscious and unconscious, that the unconscious knows everything, I think it's not so uh poetical that it seems. Sometimes you need to just be aware of what's going on and for me, the conscious mind is the one that is holding the, the steering wheel, is the one that is driving the bus or the car, you know? So we cannot just say, okay, the car will do all the work, except if you have a Tesla. But uh, <laughs> I, I think our brains are not yet Tesla brains. <laughs> uh, Michelle, Claire's asked uh, if you could clarify, uh, would you please give me an example of control and let go? It's not very clear to me. Okay. Uh, I, I was at one moment in a Vipassana uh, seminar. You know, Vipassana is, um, is a method, uh, a meditation method, where during 10 days, you are not allowed to talk. You are not allowed to look at people in the eyes. You just are there to meditate and that's it. And in the beginning, it did tell you, okay, you need to learn how to let go. And actually, yes, after 10 days, if you create an environment where uh, you understimulate the internal dialogues, you will ultimately let go. But I think there are also other methods and the, one of the, this method is using a form of control. For example, letting go is, for instance, letting go of all those internal dialogues, you know, all those things that you say to yourself. In order to do that, you need to take some kind of control. One of the excellent methods that Richard gives is the STFU method, you know, shut the fuck up. And that works. <laughs> What's amazing about this is that you take the control. When you have those internal dialogues that are just going around inside of your head, just at one moment saying, going, stop that, stop, shut the fuck up. Over. And it works. So this is a form of control. Control for me is knowing what you want to do. Just like in a car, you know, if you're uh, driving on snow, you need to control the car. 
And sometimes by doing counterintuitive things, for example, when the car starts to turn by itself on the right, you know that you will need to turn, uh, to, to turn the, um, the wheels to the left. You know, for example, also that when you're on snow, if you want to stop, never use the brake, because if you brake, you lose control. It's counterintuitive. And I think that with the brain, it's the same thing. Sometimes you need to have that control because in order to get to a given result, sometimes you need to do some counterintuitive things, you know? So the, this is the way I, um, I tend to explain uh, how to use control in order to let go, you know? Because if you just rationally what you what would you do i want to let go okay i would just repeat in my mind okay i want to let go i want to let go i want to let go okay no more internal dialogue but man i am doing an internal dialogue when i'm doing that so again it's counterintuitive and and, and you need to have that uh, to take a step back to watch this and to really ask yourself what is the end result that i want where am i now and how do i get there and this requires a big bunch of control, but in the in the good sense of the word. Awesome. Claire, does that answer your question, my dear? Look at that. Happy smiles and a thumbs up. That's what we like to see. Uh, and uh, just quickly before I move on, just one more in the same topic uh, from Mike. Is it the same flow state for translation as opposed to activities other than translation? Yeah, for me, yes. And it is exactly what I do also when I do physical things like sport or anything. Uh, for me, it's exactly the same state. Yeah. So, so you have a state that you recognize as your flow state. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming yeah. that you've anchored that quite powerfully to engage when you want. Yeah, to. yeah, exactly. And this is the power of NLP then, because anything you can do, you can anchor it, you can reproduce it. You can work on it. It's not easy, uh, and, and I don't want it to be easy because when it's easy, it gets bo it gets boring, you know. So uh, I, I like the fact that it's not always easy to do it, but I, I like the challenge. <laughs> so I, I see a great back. question that just uh, pop, popped up here. Uh, I, I would really like to answer it because I, I love it. Uh, two, uh, from, two fans or Olga's one? Two, 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 yeah, from two fans. Okay, is there so a difference? Yeah, is there silencing? a difference in silencing the internal dialogue if your preferred representation system is auditory digital internal okay. dialogue? And they, I love the question because, you know, um, when we talk about the, the five senses, uh, there is generally a kind of misconception for example if you have a child that is uh, that learns easily with visual uh, with his visual capacities very often the teachers will tell them okay so use visuals make drawings make this make that and for me this is counterproductive so what I mean, uh, and I will uh, immediately get back to the question. Uh, if you're already good in visual, you better work the auditory and the kinesthetic because learning and everything in the brain works with synesthesia, so combining the senses. So somebody who is good at visual, uh, I really advise them to work on the auditory and kinesthetic. Why? Because the brain likes what is similar. So if somebody is more visual, he will very much enjoy working with visual, but the brain learns with difference. So here uh, in the question, when you have uh, somebody who is very auditory and who has internal dialogue, working on stopping the internal dialogue is a very good exercise because the person actually goes out of their comfort zone and enters into a learning zone. And this is the best possible situation. An auditory person who masters their internal dialogue, this is perfect. What would you do to start uh, entering the state of flow? For me, uh, it really starts with that, uh, with occupying the conscious mind, really. Uh, for me, that was the, the breakthrough. When I started to, to find ways 
to occupy my um, my conscious mind, it was much easier than to integrate the the unconscious part of what I'm doing. And this is the flow state, you know. Um, the, this uh, this traditional learning uh, model that says that first you're unconsciously incompetent, then you become consciously incompetent, then you're consciously competent, and then you're unconsciously competent. So it's just going to that last step, you know, where you are skillful, where you know how to do things, but you do it automatically without any conscious action. The problem when you, when the conscious mind is working, the conscious mind is the one that creates limiting beliefs, that creates boundaries, limitations. For example, when you're translating, you know that there are many people relying on you and you have at one moment, a moment where you're a bit tired or a moment where the speaker starts to accelerate. It's very easy to generate a stress. Man, what if I cannot do it? What if I start to miss something? And you're screwed. At that moment, you're screwed. It's same in sport, you know? There is a very nice video that you can find on Roger Bannister. Roger Bannister, and the video is about three minutes. Uh, he was a, a student in medicine in 1954. And he was not even a runner, a professional runner. But uh, at that moment medicine and the world of uh, sports considered that it is impossible for a human being to run one mile in less than four minutes. Impossible. Humanly impossible. And actually nobody could do it until Roger Bannister, the little student uh, who didn't know it was impossible, did it. And What's very interesting is that this moment where he did it was recorded. And there is one video on YouTube that you can find where he's commenting what's happening in his mind, where he explains that flow state that he's feeling at that moment. And the fact that at one moment he felt that he was late so that he wouldn't make it. And he said, okay, so fuck it. If I, if I cannot do that, I will just take pleasure and just do it yeah, with no expectations. And he explains everything that's happening in his mind. And I love that video. It's yeah, three or four minutes. Just type Roger Bannister and you will find it. It's in black and white. And what's great with that is that as long as you have that belief that it's not possible, it won't work. And right after he did it, in the next two years, 37 people did it. Yeah. 37 people. Nothing changed. Their body didn't change. Uh, the world of medicine didn't change. The only thing that changed were the beliefs. If, one, if he could do it, why couldn't I do it? So, so really here, the, um, to enter the flow state, it's really about getting rid of all those conscious uh, barriers that we, that we give to ourselves. And the way that I found is to play on a game. This is my way. It's the way I do it. And it's easy when you do a, an intellectual task, like translating or something like that. Uh, I wouldn't play on my telephone while running outside or doing something physical. <laughs> it would be a nonsense. But here again, it's about thinking about what I want to do. And my goal when I want to get in a flow state is to shut the conscious mind off or to occupy it enough for it not to interfere and not to bother me. Wonderful. Uh, Mike's asked, would different people have different flow states? Yeah, I think everybody has his own flow state. That's why it's important to be aware of yourself, aware of how you function, of how you react, um, aware of all those little signs that happen in life. You know, like, for example, the headache before. Okay, I know that I need to ground a little bit. I know that something, yeah, it's something is like <laughs> wrongly wired inside. I, I need to fresh air, etc. And, and the more you know yourself, the easier it gets to, to enter into those optimized states, you know. And sometimes a little detail can completely screw things up, you know. 
So it's important to pay attention to details, to pay attention to how you function, to uh, and to notice how people do that. I, I like you know when I see sports people to ask them, okay, describe me your flow state exactly like um, the way that Roger Bannister is doing it in the video. And I like describe it to me. And sometimes there is one thing the person will say. I said, oh yes, that's a good idea. Like playing the game is something that somebody told me. I don't even remember who it was. And he said that it's the only way he has to shut the conscious mind off. I tried it and it worked perfectly. So yeah, I just use it. And this for me is efficient modeling. It's taking small pieces from people, trying them. What works, I keep it. What doesn't work, I don't throw it away because it can be useful when I'm working with clients to have ideas because it's not because it's not working with me that it's uh, it's not working at all you know so I keep all that in mind but I will really focus on things that work for me yeah fantastic uh, our third topic this evening is one that uh, it's fascinated me through my life because it's very different coming from the bottom of the world down in New Zealand and that is that of languages um, a very popular topic, the initial learning of languages and then being able to extend fluency in second, third and fourth languages. Did, did you set out to learn languages as a goal somewhere along the line or is this from moving? I'm intrigued. It, the, the very first foreign language that I learned was, uh, was Romanian. And uh, there was something very interesting with this language because uh, I was in love it was my ex-wife and I went to Romania she was she was speaking fluently English Italian uh, because uh, in Romania it's very common to have schools where you speak four languages that's common uh, so it's very nice for children, but uh, yeah, it's uh, for, even for me, it was quite amazing. And her parents were speaking also French. And I remember that the first time I got there, I thought it was a joke. She told me, uh, you know, from now on, we're not going to speak neither French nor English. We're going to speak only Romanian. I didn't know a word of that language. And they and she briefed her parents not to answer if I dare speaking in French or in English. So the thing was very interesting because uh, I thought it was a joke first, which was not the case. And uh, we were uh, around the table uh, starting to, to eat. And the father asks me, Vrei poine? And he gives me, and he, uh, he takes the basket with bread. So I could understand from the context that he was not asking my political views about, uh, I don't know, about communism, you know? I could understand that he was asking me if I wanted bread. Question, intonation, with the bread, and I said, uh-huh. And he answered to me, no se dice uh-huh, se dice da. Okay. Just with that, you understand what it's all about. You understand that, okay, you don't say uh-huh, you say da, okay. And, and this word immediately entered in my mind and I, never, I could never forget it. And they were acting with me as if I was a child, you know? And even when I didn't understand something, they would just repeat the same way, but with more emotion, you know? And amazingly, it worked quite great because after one week I was understanding almost everything really almost everything of what was being said after about two weeks I could express myself easily I would say and after three weeks there was a convention there with uh, an English speaker uh, who and my ex-wife was supposed to translate him to Romanian and at one moment, I just see that the, the organizer of the event uh, is telling everybody that there will be another translator. It will be me. <laughs> I did it. It was not very good, but I did it. 
And at that moment, I said to myself, okay, man, if I'm able to translate an English guy to Romanian when three weeks ago I didn't speak a word, now I have no excuse. And this completely broke any kind of uh, limiting beliefs I had about languages. So this was a, a very, very interesting uh, experience. And, and then I learned other languages also. And, and I really could extract what are the most important things to, to learn a new language. And this was a great experience, really great experience. So, Michelle, what were the most important things to really <laughs> learn a new language? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, there are six things that if you do them, it works. The very first thing for me is immersion. It's really being immersed in the given language. And you don't need to go to the country. This, yeah, it's better, but you don't need that. Today, you just, if you have Netflix, if you have internet, you can listen to any language during the whole day with no problem. So I would listen, if I want to learn, for example, Chinese, I would listen to Chinese musics. I would listen to Chinese conferences, even though I don't understand a word. Because the, the very first thing is that the brain needs to adjust to the musicality of the language. Language is like music. And that's exactly the way you can learn an accent. When I speak Romanian, for example, in Romanian now, I am giving uh, courses to doctorates, to PhDs in Romania, in Romanian. Uh, I give trainings. Uh, I had also not a long time ago a TV, um, a TV experience with, uh, uh, with politics from there. And people don't believe that I am not a native. Although... I never learned grammar in Romanian. Uh, it, it was three years after having, uh, after already translating to Romanian, etc., that I discovered that in Romanian there is masculine, there is feminine, and there is neutral. I didn't know about that. And it's only by making a mistake when somebody corrected me, I said, okay, that's strange because that's a masculine word. And in plural, you give me the plur the um, you give me the feminine, uh, the feminine version of it. And said, yeah, because it's neutral. Neutral is masculine in the singular and becomes feminine in plural. Wow. And I didn't, I wasn't aware of that. And I took many examples of words that are actually in this case. And I noticed that I, I, I didn't rationalize on that. Uh, then I saw the paradox that, yes, when it was uh, singular, it was masculine. Then when it was uh, plural, it was feminine. But I, I was never aware of that. So th this was uh, quite, quite an interesting experience. And this is through immersion because your brain records a lot of things that are being said, you know, even if you don't understand it. And that's the reason why you speak English fluently. Uh, and I imagine that you didn't open the dictionary 30,000 times to learn every single word that you know in English, you know? Many of those words you discovered and you learned just by observing. For example, somebody indicates something and says chair. Okay, then you should kind of understand that this is a chair. You didn't need a definition for that. So this is the second thing. Don't use a dictionary. If you use a dictionary to learn a language, I mean, like, uh, if you're English and you learn Spanish, like using an English-Spanish dictionary is a very bad idea because the brain really likes what's similar and learns with difference. So if you have a dictionary with a word, which is in English, like chair, and in Spanish, silla, the brain will stick to the thing he already knows and he will ignore the thing that is different. So you can look in the dictionary tens of times, you won't memorize the word. So dictionary is not a good idea unless you use a Spanish Spanish dictionary that explains in Spanish what a chair is, you know? And then the brain is completely in the realm of unknown 
and it will get as many information as, uh, as it possibly can get. Look at children, for example, who, uh, who don't speak English yet, like French uh, children. They listen to Rihanna and they hear that diamond in the sky. And, you know, <laughs> at one, they know all the lyrics. They can sing it even with the accent, but they have no idea what the lyrics mean. But then at school, they learn that diamond is that, that little uh, rock, you know, uh, uh, that is called diamond in French. And then they get curious. Okay, yeah. So wh what is sky? And then the teacher explained, yes, yeah, sky is yeah, this, le ciel. And then they, they start to get amazed by, okay, so it's diamond in the sky. Okay, I get it now. And you see, you can be sure that at that moment, the child will never forget those two words because there was, and that's the third part, an emotional context. There was emotion. And emotion stimulates excessively learning. Emotion, I mean positive emotion. Negative also, because when there are negative events happening to you, the brain remembers because it doesn't want to live it again. So it will remember as much as possible. But positive things work great. That's why if you want to learn language, just fall in love with somebody from speaks that language. That's one option. <laughs> but, <laughs> it could be a very expensive option. Someone. The diamonds might be cheaper. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and so that the third thing, it's emotion, adding emotion into, uh, into speaking. The fourth uh, thing that is very important is getting rid of fears. Because as adults, we fear to talk in a different language. We fear to use a different uh, accent. Like, for example, you know, when a French person is uh, learning English, they will tend to speak like that because uh, they don't want to look crazy or dumb. But the problem is that if they speak like that, it's exactly in this case that they look silly. You see? Yeah. But very often the fear makes you do completely the opposite of what common sense would tell you. A child doesn't care about that. A child, if it heard that there is a kind of accent like that, the child will just uh, amplify it, you know? And sometimes it's even funny. They amplify it. But like that, they learn. So getting rid of those fears is important. And th for this, there, there is NLP. There are many other things. Uh, getting rid of the fear of being ridiculed. All this is really important to get rid of. And that's why, and the, that was the fourth one. The fifth thing is to talk a lot. Even with a few words, you know, using this, using those few words. For example, when I, when I learn a new language, when I'm under my shower, I am thinking in that language. I am consciously doing my thinking process in the given language with the few words I know. So I cannot think about many things. But <laughs> even though there are mistakes, it's not a problem. But then you, uh, you, you create a kind, of, uh, a kind of habit for the brain to use that language uh, in a regular way. And the moment you know that you master a language is when naturally you start to think in that language, when you're not translating in your head. So it's a great thing to do from the very beginning to, to create that habit in your brain of thinking in that language. And very rapidly, when the brain just gets to it, you realize that everything uh, comes so easily. So this was the, the fifth thing. And the sixth um, very important key to learning languages is working on those beliefs, you know? If you start learning a language by believing that it will be hard, it's not a good idea. Like, like for example, some people, when I started to learn Chinese, for example, it was before the championships in China. I, I wanted to go to China and to be able to make my way in Chinese, you know, not to, to be dependent on translators or anything. So I, I started to learn Chinese and people told me, man, it's so difficult because it's so different. And I realized that it's the opposite. 
Because, you know, as a French person, if I am speaking in Chinese, uh, if I don't know a word, I simply don't know it. But if I am French and I'm learning Spanish, which are very similar languages, I can very easily mess them up, you know, and take a French word, Spanishize it, and think that it's correct when it's not correct. And then you get to learn an improper version of the language. For example, uh, yeah, in, it happens sometimes uh, with, with Polish. Uh, when, I, when I speak Polish, sometimes I, I, I speak a, a, a very special language called le frolonais. The f it's French and polonais together, you know, French and Polish and frolish, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and, and this is something that, um, that, that can happen. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you get those six points, you know, the, those six very important points, like immersion, working with fears, beliefs, talking in that language, no dictionary and putting emotion, really there's very little chances for you to fail yeah, in a language, really. Uh, you speak five languages very fluently, English, French, Romanian, and Polish. Yeah, Not and Spanish five. now. And Spanish. it is Spanish. Yeah. Uh, I, I would have added also Italian uh, a few years ago, but since I didn't practice it, now it would be hard. But I know that if I'm one week in Italy, I'm completely fluent in Italian. So, yeah, it, it, it's, it, languages are, uh, are something, you know, use it or lose it. You don't really lose it, actually, but you lose the spontaneousness, you know. You know? Uh, and then when you get into the country, when you practice it, the brain very rapidly comes back to its, um, to its good reflexes. So you never really lose it. But there is a seventh rule that I forgot mention this essential 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 and uh it's forget about grammar forget completely about grammar and and this is some uh, very counterintuitive because when you learn a foreign language at school the very first thing they want to 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 teach you is grammar i remember german i learned 11 years that language i cannot have a conversation with anybody because they managed to disgust me of that language just in the first hour so the emotions were very negative but but you know the fact is that uh grammar is not something you need to learn because you don't speak grammatically by thinking rationally about grammar you see for example a child when when a child learns the language from until the age of six or seven they just learn by hearing and repeating. And sometimes they, they mess some patterns up, you know, like in French, you know, uh, verbs like eating is je mange. Then if it's you eat, it's tu manges, he eats, il mange. But then it changes with the plural. It's nous mangeons. It's not mange, it's mangeons. And you know, when a child will just match that it's mange all the time, he will say one at one moment, okay, nous mange. And the parent, will not just start to make a grammar lesson. The parent will say, no, it's nous mangeons. And the child will memorize it. And then the child will be able to, to use the verb properly without knowing how it works. And it's only when the child speaks fluently, it's only at that moment that French grammar lessons start when he's seven, eight years old. So grammar is something that you should learn only when you're already fluent in language. For example, in Spanish, I have no clues whatsoever of grammar. But I, can, I made a master class a long time ago in Spanish. I can do it. And I do some mistakes. Yes, yeah, sure. If it's, if it's something that I didn't hear before, I will make mistakes. But people understand me. So there's no problem. And people don't even notice, you know, when it's a little mistake. So, so really forget about grammar completely at the beginning, at least. What gave you the biggest improvement on memory? And is there anything you do on a daily basis to improve it? Yes. Um, for me, the first thing that uh, helped me a lot 
was combining the memory techniques, so uh, the Tony Buzan techniques, with NLP. So adding the NLP part to it, like, uh, for example, the importance of synesthesia, um, using as much as possible uh, at least three senses, like visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. This helped a lot. The, th the second thing that helped me really uh, improve was never to take, um, for example, 20 minutes a day to work on, uh, to work my memory, never. Uh, my goal was to actually integrate the techniques in my everyday life. For example, when I was working on, um, memorizing uh, bits of information like for example lists uh, i would use that all day long you know anywhere i would go to uh, in the subway i would uh, I give myself a challenge like before the next stop i need to memorize the 10 first stops of the subway uh, of that subway which are shown you know uh, on the top of it and each time it was using the techniques in the everyday life like, if I want to go to shopping, I will not write a list, you know, I have my personal list in my mind, and I element it uh, during the week. And the, the idea for me is very simple, is that a technique is only good when it's used in uh, regularly. I mean, we have one of the most powerful computer between our, our ears here. And, you know, with all the connections it can have, you could almost put all the internet in one single human brain. But you need to go to shopping, you have six items to buy, and you need to write them down. And that's really, for me, it's a, it's crazy, you know, it's crazy. So, for example, I uh, I will use the techniques to remember that. I'm, I'm using also those techniques to simplify my life. For instance, generally when I go to bed, I have a lot of ideas coming to my mind. And generally what I was doing was switching lights on. I had a piece of, piece of paper with a pen and I was writing those things and switching light off. And you know what happened? what's happening when you switch lights on, then you, get, uh, you, you change completely your hormonal uh, activity inside, then you're not uh, sleepy anymore, and then it elements even more thinking. And I decided to use the memory techniques to uh, make me sleep better. So when I had a new idea, I would just add it in my internal database for the next day and no need to switch the lights on, no need to do anything. And in the morning, I just, uh, I, I just write down everything that, I, that I've been memorizing. So no extra stimulation with the light, everything simple, everything uh, clean. And also I use uh, the memory techniques also to possibly save my life. Because before, when I had an idea while I was driving, I had a piece of paper with a pen and I was writing them on, on the piece of paper. At, at least twice, I almost had a car accident. But now this doesn't happen anymore. So, uh, so I found a real usefulness to the techniques, you know? And uh, because of that, it's something that I do to help myself and not as a burden. And this makes the, uh, a whole difference. Once you use things in your everyday life, it's becoming pleasant, it's becoming fun. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the best way I had to improve, really. Fantastic. <laughs> Speaking of pens of paper and dropping things, uh, but I'm not driving, so we're okay. What surprising results did you not expect coming from your improving your memory? Uh, there were a few uh, side effects that I didn't expect. The very first one was that I realized while I was improving my memory that memory is not only about knowledge. 
Memory is also about attitudes. Our attitudes are encoded in our memory. And when I started to work my memory, I started also to work my attitudes in a very, very interesting way. And uh, by attitudes, I mean my way to react to stressful situations, my way to react to people uh, being rude. All this completely changed with time. And when I think back to a few years ago, how I was reacting to some hard situations in life where I was just getting crazy about uh, some things like, uh, no, 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 somebody scratching my car, you know, it was something terrible. And now when it happens, I just laugh, you know, <laughs> because it, it, it looks to me so, so uh, uh, not important that I don't even understand how I could be angry and or pissed off about that because it's just a piece of metal. Man, I'm alive, I am healthy, I live in a beautiful place, I have a family, I'm happy. Why would I just bother uh, getting angry with such stupid things? So the impact on attitude was a big thing. The second... Um, second surprise I had was that that banister effect that I was uh, saying you know that uh, that I realized uh, that the more I was doing things the less I had internal limitations so for example uh, this is the last example and that's why I like to give it because it was uh, a, a few weeks ago, I had my 40th birthday, and in 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 one way, I had uh, the idea that man, my memory is not so good as it used to be. I'm not as efficient as I used to be. And the very first thing that came to my brain at that moment is, is okay. I I need to challenge myself. And I saw uh, on TV uh, a video. Uh, it was the equivalent of America's Got Talent, but in France, you know. And it was a group of children. They were between 8 and 12 years old. And literally on the screen, they were showing numbers, three numbers per second. Of two, 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 like plus 23, minus 12, plus 83. Plus... And they were counting that, a series of 80 numbers, while saying a poem i said man and when i saw that i said man they are occupying their conscious mind hey <laughs> they're doing the same thing i'm doing so why wouldn't i be able to do the same and i discovered uh, where they learned that it was an association in france called uh, the association of the little geniuses and i wrote to them i said okay guys uh, i'm a little bit older than 15 years old but i would like to take your program <laughs> as a 15 years old <laughs> and they thought it was a joke initially and then when i told them that i uh, what i'm doing what uh, the challenge that i'm having uh, i said that i want to cover that also on youtube to to show exactly my strategies how i do to 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 do it and that's what i'm doing but in french and they they accepted me and you know the fun part i'm taking all the exercises so i'm drawing you know the the kind of things that <laughs> children from 7 to uh, especially uh, also the the drawings with two hands etc cetera, etc cetera. and at one moment they wrote to me and they said you know every month we give stars to good uh, to, to good pupils do you want to be treated as one of them and receive stars and fuck yes i want the stars <laughs> give me the stars <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah and nobody knows that i'm 15 years years old but i've been discovered because uh, at one moment i received an email from uh, an old friend of mine who was one of my clients and she said is it you and she made me a screenshot of the list of the students and yes why because my eight-year-old daughter is in the program with you <laughs> so now yeah i've been discovered but but that was uh, one very important, uh, surprising result that I have is that uh, it's as if my brain had developed a kind of automatic reaction to limiting beliefs. When something pops up, immediately there is a kind of reaction. Okay, how can I get rid of that? 
Uh, and this, this was not programmed. This was not something that I intended to do, but it happened naturally. And I think it's good to realize that because it's a great, uh, it's a great, uh, uh, it's a great methodology to, uh, to learn new things. While we're on the topic of little geniuses, um, now that you're highly effectively working in the age bracket of seven to 15 as a little genius, uh, Manel's question is quite pertinent. Uh, linguistic research shows that children should be exposed to as many languages as possible before the age of seven, as their brain absorption function is optimal during these stages. Would you say through NLP and the techniques you have shared, that we as adults can optimize our language learning abilities in the same way? Uh, my answer is definitely yes. It's true that the more languages you learn when you're young, the easier it gets because apparently the first language is not located in the same place in the brain than the other languages. So already just having a second language is already great. If you have a second language, it's, uh, it's good. But the, the the thing is that I like I, I liked to develop uh, a, a special belief about that because uh, for people who had only one language when they were ch children, this could become uh, a kind of problem, you know, if they think that uh, not having had a second language is a problem. So I like to say, people, you know. Even if, even you, uh, Orlando, you are bilingual. Why? Because before you were speaking English, you were not communicationless. Children, they do communicate, and their language is images. Children react to images. Children are, their basic language is images. So I like to say people, okay, you know two, at least two languages. There was the first language that you were speaking in your way before knowing English, and there is that one. Uh, and this sometimes makes some switches, you know, in people's minds that, okay, yes, yeah, so I, I can learn it. And truly, yes, I believe that the brain has a phenomenal capacity of plasticity. And we know that, for example, if now I would like to learn to read Braille, you know, for, uh, for uh, people who cannot see, it's very hard because it's extremely uh, delicate, you know, to, to be able to feel the, the Braille language. But, and studies show that too, if somebody loses sight while being a, an adult, even at 50 years old, something happens in the brain with plasticity that the brain starts to give a lot of change capacity to the person and they can learn braille very fast so the brain has the ability of generating plasticity and i think that with nlp the more you start to understand how your brain works the more it's easy to stimulate that process and, and that's why i think now i can i can learn so many new things each time faster even though i'm getting older which is not old but older but it's getting easier because i think that in some way the brain learns to create plasticity so for anybody who didn't know a second language while before seven years old i think that it's not a problem it's just about finding the right way of stimulating that process so on our approach to learning languages, would you approach learning it differently, knowing what you know now than when you started? Probably not differently, but I would have put more uh, importance on emotion. I was not aware how much emotion is helping in learning. Now I'm fully aware of that. And I think I would have put a uh, bigger emphasis on emotion. Wonderful. And, 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 you know, and to put emphasis on emotion is very easy. You know, if you want to learn a language, there are plenty of free ways of free of charge. You know, um, the, the problem and also to work with those fears that we mentioned before. The problem is that if you start speaking in a different language to somebody who is fluent in that language, very often there may be some reaction like the person laughing or anything like that. 
but there are great applications um, on the mobile phone. Um, I need to uh, remember one of them, which is very, very good. It's GoSpeaky. It's called GoSpeaky. It's an app where you register. It was free when I uh, first used it, but now I, I don't know. You just say, okay, my name is Michael. I'm French. Uh, I speak French uh, 10 out of 10. And I want to learn Russian. And my level in Russian is 0 out of 10. And somewhere on the planet, there will be uh, perhaps Tatiana, who is Russian and who will register by saying, hey, I'm Russian. I speak Russian 10 out of 10. I want to learn French and I speak it 0 out of 10. And the system will match us. And then we can make a Skype call and we end up with me knowing something she wants to learn and her knowing something I want to learn. And we cannot communicate except by showing things, you know, by images, by, uh, by showing things to the person. So, and nobody will laugh at the other because if I start to laugh at Tatiana, I know that she's going to laugh at me that later on. So people <laughs> behave a lot in those contexts. And then you start to introduce, okay, je m'appelle Michel, et toi? And she will, and she will start to understand. She knows that I'm Michael. So she said, "Je m'appelle Tatiana." Excellent, yeah, great, and and, be, and people start to to learn like that in a very easy way. And it's it, there is a lot of emotion, you know, because uh, you get to communicate with somebody you don't know, somebody who's from a language you you don't know yet. It's very emotional. And if the person doesn't play the game fairly, you can stop the call and you find somebody else. So that, that would be something I, I would do more, you know, to, to learn a new language. That's really cool. When you were talking about uh, spending the day listening to music in Spanish and listening to things in uh, different conferences and things, um, and I, I'm, I'm guessing from everything that the direction very heavily about emotion and your state and going into that flow would be simply choose music that's pleasant to your ear exactly, that is yeah. in the language of a yes. genre of music yeah yes exactly uh also watching movies uh, is another option and uh, one advice if you're watching a movie let's say you want to learn italian and you watch an italian movie put the subtitles but in Italian, not in your language. Because if you put it in your language, the same thing, the brain likes what's similar and learns in difference. If there is the text in English, the brain will focus on the text and will ignore what is being said. But take any movie, let's say you don't speak Chinese. Look at one Chinese movie with the subtitles in Chinese once, a second time, a third time, a fourth time, you will notice that very slowly there is a kind of feeling inside that you start to understand what's, what, what's going on. Why? Because communication is perhaps only 20% with the words that are being said. The rest is the nonverbal, paraverbal. So you can understand a lot out of it. And uh, when I was learning Arabic, I started like that. And you know what the important, the interesting part is that you can guess what people say. When, when people meet each other and they say, Salam Aleikum, you, you can understand that they are not talking about politics again, you know, they are saluting each other. And the second part is as soon as you know that, for example, Arabic is being read from right to left, the brain starts to match the sounds it listens with the letters that are appear on the screen. And I learned the alphabet in Arabic without even learning it. I started to have an intuitive knowledge of the, uh, of the, um, of the alphabet. And naturally at one moment, I was able to read words that I didn't know because I knew that this letter was the R sonority, for example the R sound, or this one was this sound, etc., etc. So it's a very good thing to look at movies in the language you want to learn, especially if you don't understand it, because when you don't understand, the brain is very aware. The brain needs information, so it will just get it. It will let it in, let it in, let it in, and match it with what it sees. 
and what it interprets from the situation. So it's a great way of learning a language. Although well, I'm not really a fan of TV at all. So. Is it useful to, to watch something that's at a child's level, for example, so they're speaking more slowly, or do you just dive right in there? Oh, I just dive right in there. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, always, I like to model the experts in things. And in language, the experts at learning languages are babies. When you speak to a baby, you speak normally. You don't start to speak slowly, you know? Yeah, you speak normally and then they catch uh, at the beginning they don't catch many things then they catch more but yeah I, I like to enter right into the into the thing yeah. would you equate the flow state to the so-called buddhist zen state yeah I, I don't know the the buddhist zen state but i think that it, it's all different words to talk about the same thing for me and I like to think like that because uh, it makes thing, things simple. I, I love the concept of um, uh, uh, that compl that concept of simplicity that has been used by um, by Steve Jobs, you know, in Apple. That perfection comes when you when when you cannot get anything out, not when you cannot add anything new, you know. So simplicity, perfection is in simplicity, really. So 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 even there. Um, the, the the more you can make things simple, the easier it's going to be to integrate it and to learn it. So, yeah. How do you immerse yourself when you live in a place that speaks English? Do you set times to do immersion? Do you also set times to do thinking in the learned language? Okay, I, I do two things. I will put in the background uh, audios in the language I want to listen to, for example, when I'm cooking, when I'm cleaning uh, the house, etc. So there are always voices with talks, etc. I like to, to, um, uh, to take some audios about things that I like. So sometimes there are words that just yeah, click in my mind, you know, because even in uh, languages that are, are very different, like Arabic, like Chinese, there are some, especially technological words are very similar. So since I love technology, sometimes I hear a word and say, oh man, I think I understood that. And it creates, you know, some kinds of um, emotion at that moment. So yes, I will be listening to things in the background all the time. And, um, and yeah, I will try then, try is not really the good word, but I will <laughs> make the, the good efforts to think as much as possible in the, in the given language. All right. What technique for getting rid of fears works best for you? For me to get rid of fear, uh, I use uh, what is called in NLP pattern interrupts. Because for me, a fear is nothing more than a trance state. It's a hypnotic state. Um, why do I say that? Because you know, if you're afraid of spiders, if you get in, if you are in front of a tarantula, it's normal to be afraid. But if somebody shows you the picture of a tarantula, it's just a piece of paper with colored ink on that and when your body reacts as if it were real you know that there's something happening inside and this is the pure definition of hypnotic states a hypnotic state is a state where the brain imagines something and acts as if it were real this is a trance state so to get rid of fear i go i start with the principle that it is a state of trance that I enter in. And in order to get out of a trance state, the best way is interrupting the pattern. So doing something completely crazy or stupid that stops the, this progression, you know? And sometimes it can be as simple as going to the bathroom, putting some cold water and just uh, putting some cold water on your face. At that moment, the brain doesn't expect that. So what happens is that the brain goes out of the trance enough for you to be able to take control, to use your conscious mind to say, okay, now, okay, I, I can have the control. Because if you let yourself dive right into the problem, 
at one moment, your conscious mind is completely shut down. You know, that's protection system from the brain. If, if you have fear, the uh, neocortex is being shut down. So you cannot uh, rationally react. So for me, working on fear, the best tool is uh, understanding that uh, the thing that um, fear is a trance state and using pattern interrupt to stop it. Do it once, two times, three times, four times, and then you get exposed to the problem. And it doesn't bother you at all. It works for me. It works great. Awesome. What would your advice be to someone who cannot, who often cannot extract from their memory words when they need to say slash write it, despite they know it, know them perfectly? You know, you know, but you don't get the word. Yeah, that's a very, very common thing. It, it's the, a syndrome that is very common with students. It's the white page syndrome, you know, that you, you, you come to the exam, you know that you know that because you just learned that and it doesn't come. There is one big reason for that is stress, okay? Big reason. As that's why sometimes if you if you look for a word and you cannot find it, sometimes the, the best thing is to think about anything else, do something else, and at one moment, tuck, the word pops in your mind. Why? Because the stress level goes down and then the brain can again access to uh, the memory and it works. So that is one uh, interesting way uh, of doing things. The second way that I'm doing to avoid that is to um, is to use association you know what um, to associate things to each other for example if you need to learn a list of words if you just try to memorize the list uh, by repeating the list you may very easily miss one of them or completely miss everything but if you create a story you know a complete story that connects those words, you know? Uh, for example, the first word is elephant, then you have a light bulb and you imagine a big elephant coming and trying not to hurt the little light bulb here, etc. And you make up a story, you are going to remember it because the brain is made to remember stories. And when you have that, even if somebody is asking you, okay, so what is the list of words? you won't feel any stress and you cannot have that moment where the word just disappears because it's just a story and the brain is made to remember stories. So yeah, those are the two ways I would use for, uh, for that problem. Would you say that children with language disorders slash delays can be taught these strategies to develop one language? Yes, I, I think so. And for the moment, I never encountered any child who would not have been able to. But for, for me, the brain, we all have the same brains, except if there is a physical damage in the brain, we all have the same brains. So it's not about the brain itself, it's about how we use it. And I think that the reason why there are some children who have what people call disabilities, it's not the child that has a disability, it's the teaching system that was not able to find the right way to teach the child. And it's, it's, uh, it gives a lot of responsibility to the person teaching, but in this, uh, at the same time, it gives an amazing hope to any child, you know, that everything is technically possible just need to find the right way. For example, a child, uh, a child who is hyperactive, uh, at school, for example, uh, the teacher will just complain that the child is unable to concentrate, etc. But put the child on a video game, he will be concentrated for four hours with no problem. So the problem is not the child. The problem is the environment, the stimulation that is there. And you need to find a way to stimulate the child as much as he's being stimulated when he's playing at the game. At that moment, you, you got it. So the disabilities, mm. I think it's this, exactly the same thing. It's just a strategy that is not the right one. And if you find the right way to do it, it should work. 
Wonderful. Michelle, thank you so much for this awesome evening. Um, I, I know I just want to share something from my own experience from everyone. Uh, if anyone's interested in increasing their speed of reading, um, <clears throat> then uh, I, I'll make available a link to you. I know, Michelle, you've got a link. You sent me a link that I requested uh, to your website. Michelle uh, has an online course. Uh, I think it's 10 or 12 hours from memory from doing this one, uh, uh, In English, I have uh, speed reading and speed reading is about yeah. four hours. It's just, you know, it's the Pareto rule. It's the 20% of techniques that will give 80% of the result. So um, yeah, in, in speed reading, I have it in English. Unfortunately, I don't have the others in English. So the, the speed reading uh, course, I'll, I'll put a link available to everyone for the speed reading course. I, I actually bought the course uh, three, four weeks ago. And in good uh, English fashion, it would appear I'm learning how to live here. Uh, I bought the course and then I started it two and a half weeks later. Uh, <laughs> um, I actually did, I went through the whole course uh, in one weekend. Um, my baseline words per minute, uh, when I initially tested myself, as Michelle gives um, instructions how to do so, was at about 260 words a minute. Uh, it's now not quite two weeks later, but will be this weekend, and I'm averaging 450 words a minute. And I'm absolutely confident um, uh, that I'm gaining the result of actually learning the information that's in the book because I'm then testing it by relaying the information at home, discussing what I've been reading with Amanda. And it seems like most of what I've had to say is making sense. So <laughs> um, I absolutely uh, thoroughly encourage anyone that's interested there. But Michelle, if uh, members of this call or otherwise um, would like to get in contact you with, with anything we've discussed this evening or anything that you've touched upon, uh, are you happy for me to share details for yourself? Um, sure. Absolutely. Sure. My email, Wonderful. anything. Yes, sure. Wonderful. So, look, everybody, you're very welcome to unmute yourself for a moment and uh, give a big thank. And, and you know what? You know what I'm going to do. I, I'm going to to. Uh, we didn't talk about that with Orlando, but I can make a, a little discount if anybody wants the training. Uh, I, I can prepare a, a code for with a discount for the training. If you if you want, you can, you can post it then uh, under the video. Well, I, I will do it just after the. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Well, if you, you fire that through to me, and then I'll I'll just share it out to everybody, and then. Uh, but uh, Michelle, thank you so much for your time this evening. I know I've appreciated it. I think everyone else here is as well, and uh, I look forward to another extending another invitation to you in the future, my friend. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. Thank 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 you.